The Lunar New Year is a two-week celebration that begins on the second new moon of the new calendar year, and each year is characterized by a zodiac animal, 2021 being the year of the ox. Type a yes or a plus in the chat if you were born in the year of the ox. If not, list your zodiac animal if you know it. Myself, I'm a rat. Um, so Larry Mock is one of the museum's inimitable docents and is going to introduce us to his family's Lunar New Year tradi traditions. It's my pleasure to welcome him here tonight. Larry, take it away. That's Cantonese for happiness and prosperity for the new year. I'm a third generation American and I'd like to tell you about uh, my family's background and how we celebrate um, Chinese New Year. Now, the Chinese have been coming to this country for almost 200 years, and they come from all parts of China, and then they've been coming at different times. So to start with that, I'd like to tell you some of my story and how we celebrate. So I'm gonna share my screen and show you how we celebrate. And I'll start where my roots, my family roots come from in Southern China. So my grandfather came to the United States in the late 19th century. And the rest of my family came at that time and in the early 20th century. So the customs that I know about, the customs that we celebrate come from this early part of the 20th century and even the 19th century and the practices that continue here. So I'd like to show you a picture in the 1930s in Southern China. This is my mother. And although my, both my parents were born in the United States, my mother actually grew up in Southern China and in Hong Kong. So this is where probably the bulk of what I know about Chinese New Year's come from, is from my mother. This year is the year of the rat now. And it's based on a Chinese Lunar New Year calendar where each year is assigned to a different animal and it goes into a cycle of 12 animals. So the coming new year, which is uh, February 12th, will be the year of the ox. Now, I'm starting to already plan for my Chinese New Year that's coming up. So right now I'm thinking about, we will need fresh flowers and seasonal flowers uh, such as quince or plum blossoms are available. And this is a photo of one of the best places to get New Year's flowers. And at this time of year, the Grant Avenue in San Francisco Chinatown is closed off and there's a huge flower market and you can get really wonderful arrangements of flowers there. These will be displayed in your home along with perhaps uh, tangerines and you'll see that the tangerines here have green leaves. So grocery stores that have a Chinese clientele will be sure to have tangerines with the stems and leaves attached because that's the most auspicious. And when you're in Chinatown and perhaps even in someone's home, you'll probably see these red strips of paper with Chinese writing on it on either side of the entry door. And these are auspicious sayings uh, to sort of give you good wishes for the new year. So you sort of get the theme that everything is, is supposed to be lucky and give you good fortune. But actually the most important part of my New Year's is New Year's Eve. And we prepare for a New Year's Eve feast because at New Year's time and at New Year's Eve, your family is supposed to gather and reunite and celebrate with this feast. And you see here in this photo, the, the many, many different items for the main dish of our New Year's feast, which is a Buddhist vegetarian dish called jai. And I have to go through and figure out what I need and what I need to do 
to prepare. So it takes really several days to sort of gear up to do the chai dish. And these dehydrated uh, foods need to be rehydrated, uh, chopped and prepared all to get ready for this dish. So the, this is probably done the day before of the cooking, but actually on the day of the cooking to really prepare for the feast, you might go to a Chinese delicatessen where they also gear up and have all these roast pigs, roast, roast porks rather, and um, ducks and chicken and what have you. And there's be long, long lines of people waiting to get the choicest cuts of meat. And of course you're always hearing, it can't be too fat, it can't be too lean, it has to be just right, it has to be just this part of the animal. And these people behind the counter are just chopping like mad with their cleavers and it's really a sight to see. So for our New Year's dinner, we always have something that is from the water, from the land and from the air. So for water, there'd be fish and for land, land here's a, a roast pork and then perhaps chicken or something or duck, something like that. And here's a photo showing the jai, the Buddhist vegetarian dish that I showed you before. Uh, this is from our last New Year's Eve. And here's another tradition that I didn't grow up with and that's making of uh, dumplings at New Year's time. Understand it comes from Northern China. So I learned it from others and like it so much that now I've made it part of my own serving uh, dumplings at Chinese New Year's. And this is my family making New Year's dumplings. And this is a picture of the dumplings being served. And you see in the back, there's also the tangerine with red green, uh, with red leaves, not red leaves, green leaves rather and red envelopes in the back. Now that red envelopes is really important for kids because when you say gung hei fat choi to an elder, they are expected to produce a red envelope with money. So many times you practice your best gung hei fat choi and you say that and you might end up with many, many red envelopes. So this is how I celebrate Chinese New Year with my family. And there's one other thing that many times we celebrate. And as uh, Allison said, it lasts for about two weeks. And he, at the end of that two weeks, there's a very American invention that celebrates Chinese New Year's. And that's the Chinese New Year's parade, where you could see martial arts demonstrations, floats, marching bands, most of all, firecrackers, as you see here. So those are our traditions and they pertain to me only because everybody picks and choose the traditions that they like. And I choose to actually celebrate St. Patrick's Day and have corned beef and cabbage, just like probably you do too. Well, I don't know necessarily the origins of all of the traditions that are celebrated for Chinese New Year's. But I think that's next on our agenda. So gong hei fa choi and see you soon. Thank you for sharing your family story and Lunar New Year traditions, Larry. I really appreciate the spirit of evolving traditions that are inspired by your own culture, as well as your geographic location, your friends and your family. Um, and yeah, looking at all those delectable photos of the food you prepare with your family and the, the parade makes me long for in-person Lunar New Year festivities here in, in San Francisco. Um, so you talked about what you do to celebrate the Lunar New Year, but I know there are some things you're not supposed to do. Can you tell us about some of those? Well, everything you do on the first day of the New Year is supposed to be auspicious because that sets the tone for the rest of the year. So you're not supposed to be cleaning house and actually you're not supposed to be cooking. Um, you're not supposed to be doing anything that's drudgery. So 
you're supposed to take the day off from work. But that's not always practical. So sometimes I work on New Year's Day. But I get around that by thinking as a small business owner, I say, well, I'm fortunate that I have business that I need to do the work. So that you know, contributes to my prosperity. So that's one thing that you're, I, you're not supposed to do that I actually do. That's great, thank you. Um, so yeah, if the audience members can add your Lunar New Year traditions in the chat, love to know how you celebrate. So our next presenter, storyteller Fred Shen, is going to tell the tale of Neon the Beast. Many existing customs and activities associated with the Lunar New Year Festival can be traced back to this story. Uh, Fred, take it away. Thank you. There once was a beast who threatened every town and village on the coast of China. This beast lived in the ocean and it was big, bigger than any fish you would see, but it was no fish. For instead of scales, it had thick black fur. And instead of fins, it had three sets of legs. It had a long snout and tiny black eyes and rows and rows of sharp teeth. The people called this beast Nian. Now Nian spent all this time sleeping on the ocean floor. And in fact, would only wake up once a year on New Year's Eve. Now, when the beast woke up, he was hungry. And you would think, well, that's fine. There are all those fish all around him. But the only thing that would satisfy the beast's hunger was human flesh. So on New Year's Eve, the beast would emerge from the ocean. Now the beast had a super sense of smell. And once the beast locked on to the scent of a human being, nothing could get in its way. And I mean, nothing would stop it because of its size. And also because of his eyesight being so poor, the beast would not worry about walking around anything. It would walk right through following the scent. The villagers had no defense against the beast. So every New Year's Eve, every villager would pack up and flee up high into the mountains to hide from the beast. And that's exactly what this one young man was doing, running around as the day was getting later, packing up. His wife was getting their child ready to go. When he saw his mother, a strong-willed and sort of a cranky old woman, just sitting there, Amma, uh, why aren't you getting ready? We need to leave soon. It's going to get dark. Aya, son, these knees are too old to walk up that mountain one more time. And you know how cold it's going to be tonight? Forget it. If the beast wants me, I, he can have me, I'm staying right here. Well, of course, the son begged his mother to change her mind, but it was no good. And it was getting later and later in the day and he had to protect his wife and his baby. So they left, as did all the villagers. Soon, the old woman was by herself in the village and you know, she rather liked it. This is the first time I've ever been alone. Oh, well, if this is gonna be my last night, I'm making my favorite dinner, which turned out to be dumplings. So she went inside, pulled out her big wooden chopping block, got her two cleavers and went onto the piece of pork that was on the bar. Dunk, 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 dunk. Oh, uh, by the way, if you are at home and wanna make some noise, please join in until the pork was finely minced. She wrapped her dumplings up and had them all ready to prepare. Well, she thought, hmm, she could see the sun setting. She thought she would go out to get one last glimpse of the sun. 
while she was out there, a brisk breeze flew down the road, kicking up dust. And when she looked down the road, she saw in this cloud of dust, a tall figure approaching. And this tall figure had a long cloak and a long walking staff and a long white beard. But this figure was not walking like an old man. Why, this figure seemed to be almost gliding as he approached her. Oh, whoa, Papa, you are the first person I've seen in hours. Where is everybody? Ay, yeah, don't you know what day today is? This is New Year's Eve. The beast is coming. <sighs> they all went up to the mountain. Oh, I know, I know. Why am I here? I am too old to go up. If the beast wants me, he can have me. Huh. I'm not scared anyway. Oh, stranger. So, you know, I made a lot of dumplings. You're welcome to share dinner with me. And I have to tell you, my dumplings are the best dumplings in the village. Well, who can turn down dumplings? So in they went and they had a fine meal. As they were finishing, the traveler told the old woman, hey, Lo Papa, you know, in all my travels, I've heard a few things about this beast, Nian. Um, maybe I can help you get ready in case it shows up. First off, let's move this table over by the window. And we'll put your big chopping block on it and, um, and your cleavers. And if the beast happens to put his snout into the window, you pick up those cleavers and start chopping do, 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 as loud and as fast as you can. Because you know what? The beast hates loud noises. The other thing about the beast is he is deathly afraid of fire. So, oh, I know, do you have any red paper banners? Uh, why, yes, from the celebration of my grandchild's birth. Great, here, here they are. The traveler went out the front door and pasted the banners all around. So they hung down in front of the front door and closed the door, good. So when the beast gets near the door, I will open the door, the light will shine on the red paper banners, the wind will flick them up and maybe that'll stall the beast thinking that it's their flames at the doorway. Now, finally, Lo Papa, um, I need some bamboo, not too big. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why, if you have some. Why, yes, of course, I have a whole bucket full next to the fireplace. Um, here, see, like these. Ah, perfect. You see how they're hollow inside? Lo Papa, what I'll do is when we know the beast is coming, I will pack the insides with burning embers. Pack it in, and when the embers heat the air inside the bamboo, it will pop, pop, pop. So loud noises and flames, the two things we have to battle the, the beast, because you know, that's why the beast spends all its time on the ocean floor. Before he could finish his sentence, they heard the crash of trees and the earth started to shake. <gasps> He's coming, it's coming. Blah, 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 go to the window, get ready. And before he could finish his sentence, the snout of the beast came in the window. The old woman picked up the cleavers and went, faster, louder, and the beast retreated. Oh, looked for another way in. The beast headed towards the front door. And at that moment, the traveler swung the door open and the light from the fire illuminated the red banners and they started to flap in the wind. Oh. The beast thought, oh, fire, 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 and started backing up. And at that same moment, the traveler tossed a couple of bamboo sticks right in Nian's face. Pop, pop, pop. Nian started backing up faster and faster, but the traveler wouldn't let him go. Pop. Pop, pop. Finally, the beast started running down the road, followed by the traveler. Pop, 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 pop. The faster the beast ran, the faster the traveler went. 
The bees trying to get away leapt into the air and started climbing up into the sky, followed by the traveler. Pop, 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 pop. Higher and higher into the sky they went until they disappeared behind the clouds. Well, first thing the next day, the son ran down from the mountain to check on his mother. When he got back to the house, all he saw were pieces of burnt bamboo scattered all around and these shards, shreds of red paper flapping against the house. Amma, 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 where are you? Ayya, son, why are you yelling as she comes out the door? I'm right here. And then she proceeds to tell him about the traveler and what the traveler taught her about the beast. And soon the story of how to prepare for the beast's arrival spread throughout the village. And then the next village and the next until by the next Lunar New Year's Eve, every village knew what to do to prepare for the beast's arrival. And today, many families get ready for the Lunar New Year by preparing dumplings, pasting red paper around their front doors, and having strings of firecrackers ready, just in case. Kung hei fa choy. Happy New Year. Fred, thank you. I love that story. And in fact, um, I'm already hearing fireworks in my neighborhood <laughs> in preparation uh, for the new year. Um, and in the in the chat, it seems like, uh, you know, people um, uh, look forward to making dumplings, they eat a steamboat or hot pot, there's um, a yusheng raw fish salad, which is popular in Singapore that you apparently toss high for good luck, red money, um, pockets, popping balloons. So yeah, I um, thank you all for sharing your Lunar New Year traditions um, in the chat. Um, next up is docent Bill Kinsey, who's using artworks from the museum collection to showcase the ox in his presentation, A Boy in the Ox. Bill? Uh, thanks, Allison. Um, so there are many images of the uh, ox in the museum, and um, some of them emanate from this story. So um, I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit about it. Uh, this is a Japanese hanging scroll. It's entitled Catching the Ox. It is thought to be from the early 15th century and the medium is ink on paper. The scroll illustrates one of generally 10 scenes of a Zen parable that appears frequently in Buddhist art. In the 12th century, a Buddhist monk revised a traditional Chinese story about an ox and a boy to act as a metaphor for illustrating the steps required to attain enlightenment. In the Zen Buddhist tradition, uh, enlightenment could be described as the state of perfect knowledge and wisdom combined with infinite compassion. The boy, unhappy with his situation at the start of the story, realizes that he's lost touch with something important that would bring him a sense of peace and tranquility. He sets about to remedy this condition and find his true nature. Next. Looking more closely at this hanging scroll, we see one of the early scenes of the story. After searching for the ox, then tracking its footprints, the boy finally finds it. He grasps it by the horn and steps on its neck, trying to push its head to the ground. We, the viewers, see the struggle to gain control over the powerful creature. Some scholars say that the ox represents the untamed, unruly mind. Next. Here we see a wood and lacquer Japanese writing box made around 1850 with metal, coral, and mother of pearl inlay. 
we believe the decoration depicts the following scene in the story, which is called Taming the Ox. The image shows the boy leading the ox by a rope, illustrating the patience, hard work, and discipline required to bring the mind under control and master the obstacles to understanding. Next. Notice the ox appears in the vivid color, drawing attention to its strength. This elegant writing box with the image of the boy and the ox would be a powerful reminder to its owner of the necessary work and discipline required to attain enlightenment. Next. Well, moving ahead in the tale, we now come to this image. It's a carved wood netsuke by Nanyo from the mid 19th century. This image shows that through practice and discipline, the boy has brought his mind under control, thus releasing him from his old fears and anxieties. The boy plays a flute, which suggests creativity and harmony. We might think of the ox and the boy once totally separate entities as well on their way to an integrated state. The boy has calmed and gained control of his unruly mind. The boy and the ox are two beings now working together as one. Alternatively, some scholars believe that the ox symbolizes Buddha nature perfected knowledge, wisdom, and compassion, which is the ground of all existence, and that the boy individuated ego. The boy perceives the ox as offering a cure for his malaise and desires to learn and master this understanding. Thus, the interaction between the boy and the ox represents the results of enormous effort, practice, and discipline to attain enlightenment. For either interpretation, this image suggests to the viewer that the boy and the ox are in concert at last. Next. Here we see a hanging scroll of an Enzo. This Enzo was painted between 1900 and 1925 by Nakahara Nantembo. It is ink on paper. You may ask, what does this have to do with a boy and an ox? An Enzo is a circle painted with a single brush stroke. Zen masters often drew circles to aid in their practice and teaching. It can have many significant meanings. The circle may indicate completeness or enlightenment. The vacant center suggests emptiness, that is seeing reality free of preconceptions, which is the fundamental Buddhist concept. The complete integration of the boy and the ox allows entry into the realm of awareness and total connectedness. This is the last step in the parable. In most versions of the story, the ox is no longer present. The boy and the ox have transcended their separate identities and the duality of self and other have been overcome. The awareness of interconnectivity and wholeness with all has been realized. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, those artworks are so beautiful. And you shared the scroll, the Zen scroll, which, which tells a common Buddhist story in China, Korea, and Japan. I know that although it's not related to the ox as a zodiac figure, it's um, a, a tea master would have hung that scroll um, in honor of the Lunar New Year. Is that true? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I always think of the, oh, sorry. Um, I always think of the ox as an intimidating animal, uh, but you flip the script here. Um, and I know in the Chinese zodiac, uh, people born in the year of the ox are reliable, calm, patient, conscientious, and, and trustworthy. Right. Yeah. So thank you again. Um, we now have a poll for you all. John, will you post it, please? So the ox and the cow are the same animal. True or false? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, right. Uh, I think most people think um, actually no, that they're not. Um, they're both cattle, but uh, not all cattle are cows and oxen. Oxen are working animals, while cows are female animals, kept solely for their milk, milk or meat production. Um, 
and I, I actually didn't know that before, <laughs> uh, before researching that for today. Um, so our last story is shared. Yep, great. Um, our last story is shared by Liz Nichols, one of the museum's talented storytellers, who will tell us how the animal years got their names. Thank you, Allison. Um, can we see the slide of all the zodiac animals, please, so we remember what they are? So um, take a look at these. And I know some of you may know the answer already, but put in the chat when you look at these animals and you know that this is going to be a story about a race, who do you think is going to win? Or if you know the answer, but you want to say, which one do you think should win? Maybe it's your animal um, and why? Please share that. Okay. Um, well, I want to tell you the story that is the story that some people tell of why the years have their animal names and in the order that they have them. But before we get to the story, maybe some of us need a little stretch break. So if we could see the next slide, it's gonna show you the three main characters of this story. And I thought, and these are beautiful objects from the Asian Art Museum's collection. So look at that ox. So if you feel like it, stretch yourself, make yourself strong and big like the ox. And then maybe Join with me and make yourself really small. Squeeze yourself tiny like the rat. And then the cat. Well, we all know how good cats are at stretching. You know, they can make their um, backs curve up and they can stretch out. So if you do we call those cat cow in yoga, I think it'll help you feel a little loosened up and refreshed from sitting. All right, I think we're ready for the story. Thank you, and uh, we can say goodbye to those animals for now, but we're about to meet them in our imagination. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to push them to the side for myself. OK. Now, I don't know about you, but somehow recently, I've been having trouble keeping track of time. I mean, like keeping track of Zoom events, like the fact that one hour, one day, one week seems to be blending into the next. So we realize, especially right now, that it's hard for us as human beings to really keep track of time. And so that is why long, long ago in the ancient, ancient times, the Jade Emperor up in heaven looked down on the kingdom of China and saw that the human beings were having a really hard time keeping track of the 12 year cycle that he had created for them so that they could be doing the right thing at the right time on their farms, in terms of who they married, all kinds of things. But how could he help them remember? 12 years is a long period. Hmm. hmm, animals, human beings pay attention to animals. That would be good, but which animals? And the Jade Emperor decided he couldn't decide. And so he would have a contest. And so he sent out invitations and announced a great race from one side of the Yellow River, the Great Yellow River, all the way to the other. And animals came from near and far, and they lined up on one bank at the starting line. And among those animals were two great friends, rat and cat. And rat scurried back and forth, back and forth along the line of all the animals. There were, there were animals with wings. There were animals with four legs. There were slithering animals. There was animals of every size and shape. And as Rat looked at them, Rat, who is very clever, as are people born in the year of the Rat, 
thought and said to Cat, you know, I'm the littlest, littlest animal. I'll never win this race. I don't know what to do. You're right, said Cat. We'll never either of us win. But Rat uses brain power. And Rat came up with a plan. Rat looked around for a really big, strong, steady animal with a lot of stamina. Ox, ox. Now, ox didn't even hear Rat. Ox was so focused, steady, dependable, reliable, all those things Allison said. If he had noticed, because oxes are kind too, he would have agreed to Rat's, what Rat requested. But Rat just, just went ahead and climbed up Ox's big leg with the thick, thick skin all the way up onto Ox's back right here. And Ox didn't even notice. Psst, cat, cat, come on up. And so now Cat and Rat were right here. And the Jade Emperor's assistant held up the flag and said, on your mark, get set, go. And all the animals started going, some of them flying above, some of them swimming below, some of them hopping from rock to rock, all trying to get across the great yellow river. And it was a long race, but Rat couldn't believe it. Ox was ahead. Cat, cat, we're ahead, we're... You know what Cat had done? Cat was taking a cat nap. And while Cat was taking the cat nap, Rat got to thinking. You know, Rat thought about the plan. The plan was that as Ox, slow and steady, reached the finish line, just as Ox was gonna put one big hoof over the finish line, Rat was gonna jump off and land first and be the very first. Rat thought, you know, Cat is much bigger than I am. And if we both jump off at the same time, Cat is gonna jump ahead and Cat will be first and I'll be second. And that's just not really fair because it was really all my idea and Cat would never have thought of it by himself. And so Rat decided, hmm. Hmm. and as Rat moved its nose and those whiskers began to move, Rat got another idea. Moving over close to Cat, those whiskers tickled Cat. Cat shivered, <laughs> went back to sleep. But tickle, 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 and finally, what? Rat, cat was, you know how cats can startle. Cat just jumped up and fell right off into the Yellow River. Where meanwhile, Ox was just going and going and going and going. And then Ox was about to put one hoof over the finish line and Rat jumped over and landed right in front, becoming the first, the first animal year with ox right behind. And then came 10 more animals. And I invite you to say them with me or repeat them after me because there was rat and there was ox. And then came tiger. Who came? Tiger. You can also make your body or make some sounds if you want. Uh, and especially if it's your animal year, right? Okay, so there was tiger and then came rabbit. Came who? Came rabbit. After rabbit came dragon. Came who? Came dragon. After dragon came snake. Came who? Came, you say it. After snake came horse. Came who? Came after horse came sheep, that's me. Came who? Came 
After sheep came monkey. Came who? Came monkey. After monkey came rooster. Came who? Came. After rooster came dog. Came who? Came dog. And last of all of the 12, a lazyish animal who'd been rolling around in the muddy parts of the river came pig. And then came all the other animals who didn't get to be one of the animal years, including the wettest, most bedraggled, most pissed off cat that's ever been seen. And that is why rat comes first and ox comes second and cat's not even in the zodiac at all. And that's also why instead of being the best of friends, cat and rat are now the worst of enemies. And now you know the story. Liz, thank you. I, I love your telling of that story. And I, I felt um, like we were all here together um, sharing space when at the end when you, you did the kind of call and response. So thank you for that. Um, I appreciated the stretching too. That was wonderful. Now, I know you have to go to another event. So we'll say goodbye now. And thank you so much. Bye. Uh, so we've got one final poll. John, will you share our final poll, please? So, the next one. So which of these famous people was not born in the year of the ox? We've got Malala Yousafzai, Barack Obama, Vincent van Gogh, and Mahatma Gandhi. Oh, <laughs> this, is, this is good. Um, okay, so most of you have voted. Should we end the poll and tell you uh, which is the right answer? Let's do that. Um, it's okay. So um, a majority thinks Vincent van Gogh. It's actually Mahatma Gandhi, who was born in the year of the snake. <laughs> So we've got some questions in the chat. Um, let's see here. Um, why is it important to have new money for the red envelopes? Um, Larry, do you um, do you have an answer for that? Well, for the New Year's, things should be prosperous and good, and you don't want old used. So a lot of people. You know, if they're going to give uh, money in red envelopes, they'll go to the bank and ask for crisp new bills. The bigger, the better. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and then someone asks, does everyone feel their Chinese Zodiac personality matches their personality? I don't know if, um, if our presenters here want to take that on. Do you each feel like your personality matches your, your Zodiac animal? Fred? So I am born in the year of the dragon, the only magical animal on the calendar. So, well, I'm sure people would say that I am magical. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think so. Yeah. Um, I think so too, Fred. And um, from the comments uh, during your story, I think our, our guests uh, believe that too. Um, anyone else want to want to answer that, Larry or or Bill? Um, I'm born in the year of the monkey. So mischievous, nimble, quick, and clever. So yes. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, so what I'm about you, Bill? The, yeah, I'm the year of the horse. And I'm really not sure. I don't know. What are, what are my characteristics? 
Oh, the horse. Um, strong. Um, I have to look that up. I don't know these off the top of my head. Here's the horse zodiac characteristics. Let's see here. Um, oh, romantic, industrious, <laughs> enterprising, shrewd, generous, independent. Hey, I am surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, so someone in the chat says um, that her seven-year-old thinks she's like the snake. Yeah. Um, yes, and uh, Year of the Horse suits, suits folks well. Um, oh, but it also depends on what time and season you're born. So yeah, there are a lot of, of factors that go into that. Um, well, we're we're done for the night, but before we before we go, I wanted to share in the chat a resource for our Lunar New Year uh, cultural celebration packet, which is on the museum's website. It's really wonderful. It's got um, storytelling videos and um, collection objects from from the museum's collection. Um, uh, art activities, great books, and other resources uh, for you to explore um, and deepen your understanding of, of the Lunar New Year. So I want to thank you all for joining us here tonight. Thank you so much to our incredible storytellers and docents. Um, this was really fun. It was great to hear your stories and to hear your presentations about the Lunar New Year and about the Ox. Um, so uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, and I hope that you have a healthy and prosperous year of the ox. Gong hei fa choi. Gong hei fa choi. <laughs>